thank you to ICC for inviting me to come back to Brazil. I've been here several times and I've always enjoyed it. Um, and for the opportunity to speak at the PSA LATAM meeting. So we've heard that we are living in a world where there is a global move away from antibiotics, uh, particularly for growth motion use. Um, and it's been led in large part by developed countries, uh, particularly, particularly the European Union. Um, and this has been accomplished through legislation. That has been followed by exporting countries, countries that are producing poultry for sale in these countries and they need to follow uh, the same production systems in order to be able to sell their product. In other markets, uh, such as the market in which I work, Canada, also the United States and Australia, uh, there has been also a move towards the removal of antibiotic growth motors, but it has been industry-led. And essentially, the industry has um, approached the government and said, we are moving away from antibiotics in a way and at a pace that we can sustain and manage with the objective of moving entirely away from the antibiotic use. And the governments have said, as long as you're making adequate progress, uh, this is, is going to be acceptable. So it's been more of an industry-driven uh, approach, probably to avoid uh, being told when and how to accomplish that. Now, there are also uh, many developing countries that are, are producing uh, for their own domestic consumption, um, and I've had the opportunity to work in Colombia. I've had the opportunity to visit many developing countries. And those countries are moving away from antibiotic use as well. Now, there's a couple of reasons for this. Even though it's not a local demand or, or necessarily driven by the local consumers, but governments uh, are being prudent, I think, in terms of moving the industry towards that. Uh, and I think also a lot of the pressure comes from the large consumers, so the, the restaurant chains uh, that globally cannot be seen as having uh, one set of rules or one set of performance standards for rich developed countries and another set of standards for uh, developing countries. So um, regardless of the, the drive, we are seeing a move towards uh, the removal of antibiotic growth motors. And we can see that this occurs along a different timeline in different countries, but uh, even countries where um, there has uh, historically perhaps been uh, less concern about the use of antibiotics, we are seeing legislation driving the industry towards us. So this is a global issue and one that regardless of where we're working, regardless of our uh, geographical location, we need to, to accomplish this. Now, we have the advantage uh, of looking towards, for example, the EU and gaining from their experience in, in uh, finding some of the success that they've been able to do. It's not a perfect transition, but I think there, there are opportunities and I think there are a lot of success stories. So we need to keep that in mind as well. We've talked about antimicrobial resistance, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time with it. Uh, the reality is that when antibiotics, when a particular antibiotic is introduced, often within a matter of a couple of years, we start to see resistance to that antimicrobial uh, being developed. So antimicrobial resistance is a very real phenomenon, um, and it's one that we need to keep in mind. And so certainly prudent use of the existing antibiotics uh, as the new antibiotics slow to a trickle, uh, we need to make sure that we're using them as well. Now, I want to point out that the reason that this is such a challenge is that the countries that are experiencing the greatest increase in meat production, uh, the countries where there is the greatest drive to gain efficiency, to gain productivity, those are the countries where um, perhaps on the one hand, there's more incentive uh, to use antimicrobials because often conditions, growth conditions are um, challenging, shall we say. Uh, and often in those countries, there are less um, governmental or less effective governmental oversight on the use of antimicrobials. So um, this is a challenge that as world population grows, as prosperity uh, in developing countries uh, is increasing, there's a real drive for increased meat consumption and a temptation, perhaps, to 
um, cut some corners. And, and um, I think uh, that uh, we need to keep this in mind. We use antibiotics because they have been effective. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this in the context of antimicrobial resistance per se, but antimicrobial resistance is not because of the commercial development of antibiotics. It's not because of the use of antibiotics in animal production solely, although those can certainly play an impact. Um, this was a paper published, uh, researchers looked at uh, a cave that had been sealed for approximately 30,000 years, um, so well before the antibiotic era, and there was uh, resistance genes present in microbes isolated um, to, uh, in these microbes that were isolated from this cave. So long before the advent of commercial antibiotics, there was antimicrobial resistance. And I'm not saying this to say that, well, it's not our fault, we shouldn't do anything about it. What I'm trying to point out is that bacteria have a lot of different means to protect themselves from things that might kill them. Um, and we need to keep this in mind. I'm, I'm going to talk about some, some antibiotic alternatives at the end of my uh, presentation. And we really need to keep in mind that whatever we come up with, the microbes probably have a defense against that. And so prudent antimicrobial use and the things that we've learned and will learn through the prudent use of antimicrobials, I think we will still have to apply whatever the alternatives are. So let, let's keep this in mind. Antimicrobial resistance was present before we started feeding chickens with antibiotics, um, but uh, we need to be mindful of that resiliency of bacteria, of pathogens, to be able to um, attempt to overcome whatever we might uh, send at them. Okay, so uh, we've talked about how antimicrobials work, and so I'm not going to go through the, the, this specific list, but one thing that I want to highlight is that one of the main effects, and whether this is a direct or an indirect effect, or probably both, is that antimicrobials, growth-promoting antibiotics, largely work systemically through the reduction of inflammation, through the reduction of systemic inflammation. So it might be a, main, uh, a matter of reducing the severity of infection. It might be a means of reducing the systemic effects of a particular seriousness of uh, infection. Uh, and so when the animal is under a less inflammatory state, it's more likely to consume more feed and, and water. Um, it's more likely to use its nutrients more efficiently. So I, I want us to remember this concept. So growth promoting antibiotics are actually growth permitting antibiotics. And so if we have the genetic potential, uh, the genetic potential of the animal for growth, no matter how good our management or, or biosecurity or no matter how good the growth promoting antibiotics, we will never be able to overcome or, or surpass the level of uh, the, the genetic potential of the animal for growth. Now, what we're really trying to do is create the conditions where the bird's actual performance is as close to the genetic potential as possible. So we do that by reducing challenges, good biosecurity, good husbandry, good nutrition. And historically, we've been using growth promoting antibiotics to overcome some of the inflammatory challenges that diverted nutrients away from growth and decreased uh, efficiency and decreased uh, growth rate. So when we have a greater challenge, a greater um, pro-inflammatory challenge, which is often a bacterial uh, pressure, um, we tend to see uh, when we have low challenge, we tend to see better performance. When we have high challenge, we tend to see poorer performance. And with our growth promoting or growth permitting antibiotics, this is what we're trying to overcome or, or reduce the impact of. Now, I'm a nutritionist. I think about how things work in the gut. And then I think about how uh, the impacts uh, of a challenge or, or a nutrient work on the entire body. Um, so this was some, uh, an interesting paper uh, published uh, a, a few years ago, and these researchers looked at the surface area of the human intestine, and they came up with a number of about 32 square meters, and just if you want to visualize that, if you think of a badminton court, it's about half the size of a badminton court. So that's a huge surface area within each of us, um, and that uh, is um, an opportunity that is a place for bacteria to live and it's a place for the bacteria to interact with uh, our immune system. 
Now, in a four-week-old chicken, obviously, it's much smaller, uh, about 245 square centimeters, but it still represents a massive surface area for contact with the outside world. I always, when I, I teach my, my students, I always get them to envision the inside of the digestive tract as the outside of the bird. So I, I tell them to think about a string. If you have a string and the chicken swallows the string, but you hold on to one end. Eventually, the one end of the string will come out the other end. So you have this string, which is actually outside of the bird. It's the outside environment, but it's still within the body of the bird. So just remember that the lumen of the digestive tract is a huge point of contact with the outside world, and particularly in the gut, that outside world is very highly concentrated in bacteria. Some of those bacteria are going to be beneficial to the health of the animal. Some of them are going to be neutral, but many of them potentially could be harmful to, uh, to the bird, to productivity, uh, and to uh, the economics. So this, this, the gut is a major point of access to the bird, which is why in-feed antibiotics have been so effective. Okay, So I'm not arguing the efficacy of the antibiotics, but I do want us to think about where are the antibiotics having their effect. So we have the intestine. It's a massive point of contact with the outside world, with the outside environment, with microbes. But the gut also has this very important function, of course, of absorbing nutrients. So there has to be a balance between protecting the host, keeping the bad stuff out, and allowing selectively the good stuff, the nutrients, to pass through that barrier. Now, the immune system, there's, there's lots of different mechanisms, but I want to focus first on, on the immune system. The immune system, as we've seen from, from uh, previous talks, from Dr. Palermo Neto's talk, um, there are, there's a huge presence of the immune system in the intestine because it is a point of contact. The immune system samples what's in that environment. It, it tests, it, it uh, looks to see what microbes are present. It has learned, hopefully, to tolerate the beneficial bacteria, and so there's little to no reaction. Um, it learns to recognize something that shouldn't be there, um, a per perhaps a pathogen, uh, and to respond appropriately. So there is always a little bit of inflammation going on in the gut, and that is a good thing. A little bit of inflammation is what we want to see in the gut, but a very small amount and only as much as needed and only at the site of that sampling. We don't want to see a systemic inflammation because when we see strong inflammatory reactions at the level of the gut, we see the release of different uh, factors. So if, if we uh, look at um, endotoxin and exotoxins, uh, the, the physical effects of pathogens, the trauma that can be caused by pathogens, um, this activates a more strong inflammatory response. And so the cells, the cells of the immune system release signals that tell locally immune cells need to come to this location because we have a potential problem. Uh, when we look at systemically, there are negative effects on the muscle. So we see a breakdown in skeletal muscle to feed the immune system under severe um, under severe inflammation or strong inflammation. Uh, leukocytes are activated, and, and this has a small but important impact on uh, nutrient requirements. Uh, we also see, from an immune standpoint, activation and production of immune cells, uh, but we can also see negative effects quite rapidly on bone uh, mineralization. So one of the effects of systemic inflammation is a reduction in bone density. And so uh, systemically, we see things like fever and anorexia. And of course, if, if animals have a fever, they're using energy for maintaining a higher body temperature. They're not using that energy for growth. Um, they're, they're, they don't feel like eating. And if you think about, I don't know about you, but when I had my COVID vaccine, the next day I didn't feel very good. It's not because I was infected with COVID. It's because my immune system recognized that there was something bad there, and it was creating this response. And so on a limited scale, when there's even a subclinical inflammatory challenge, that's what's happening with the bird. It feels a little bit sick, backs off of feed a little bit, increases body temperature a little bit. And so um, this is, these are ways that we see decreased 
productivity. And so when we've used antibiotics, again, one of the main effects of antibiotics is reducing that inflammation, reducing, first of all, the severity of the reaction at the gut, and in particular, reducing the systemic implications. Now, again, under normal circumstances, many of the challenges that our birds face are not going to be pathogenic, um, and so that inflammation might not be appropriate. Um, I mentioned indirect effects. In certain cases, the antibiotics are going to control or limit the infection uh, from happening. So if we have a pathogen, we can reduce the reliance on the bird's own immune system and a strong inflammatory response because the antimicrobials are having their effect. They're limiting the growth uh, of the pathogen. They're limiting the damage that's being done by the pathogen. Uh, this is some classic work from uh, Kurt Clasing's lab, and I, I always show it, and it's, I realize it's old, but it, it really is an effective way uh, of showing the impact of growth-promoting antibiotics. So in this research, they had two environments. They had a clean environment, um, so, you know, typical, pristine university research facilities, very kind to the bird. Um, and then they also had a dirty environment, so the, the sanitation was, was not quite so good. They had uh, reused litter, there was a lot of dust and dander and things like that. So in each of those two environments, they fed either a diet that had a growth-promoting antibiotic or a diet that had no growth-promoting antibiotic. And if we look, we see that when the environment is clean, the antibiotics have no effect on, on feed intake, on feed efficiency, on body weight gain. But in the dirty environment where there's more pathogenic challenge, uh, then the antibiotic has a positive effect on growth rate. So in very clean environments, we tend to see a lower response to growth promoting antibiotics. So that's an important thing to remember looking forward to replacing antibiotics or, or not having to use antibiotics. Now, they also looked at what was going on with the immune system. And so interleukin-1 is a pro-inflammatory cytokine. And when we measure it in the blood, we take higher levels of interleukin-1 to mean that there is a stronger systemic inflammatory response. And in fact, um, the, the presence or the levels of interleukin-1 reflect what we see with performance. So in a clean environment, Antibiotics really don't change the level of interleukin-1. They don't seem, there's, there's not much inflammation to, to be reduced. In the dirty environment, when the antibiotics are fed, it reduces the level of interleukin-1, it reduces the, the level of inflammation, and this is how the growth promoting antibiotics, at least in, in part, probably a large part, but in part, uh, have their effect. Um, so again, Kurt Kleising did some really interesting work looking uh, sort of at how expensive is an inflammatory response. So um, he set up a couple of experiments. So he had a control. These birds were allowed to consume feed ad libitum. They grew at a normal rate. Uh, he challenged them with either uh, a killed E. coli, so a non-infectious challenge, but still the immune system recognizes the dead E. coli as E. coli. Uh, and then he also looked at... Um, lipopolysaccharide or LPS. And LPS is just part of bacterial cell walls. Again, the immune system recognizes uh, that um, these are bacteria and responds uh, accordingly. So uh, he measured the growth rate of birds uh, under normal circumstances or under non-challenged circumstances. Uh, when he challenged the birds, there was about a 30, 20 to 30 percent reduction in the growth rate of the birds. So that, uh, that reduction is about 20 uh, to 30 percent of the potential growth performance. So this is that lost performance relative to genetic potential. Now he also had a group of birds that was pair fed to the level of feed intake of these challenged birds. So these birds were not challenged, but they were given the same amount of feed uh, as the, the challenged birds voluntarily consumed. And what he found was that there was only a partial restoration. So about 10% um, additional growth rate uh, was uh, achieved just due to um, uh, the increase in, uh, sorry, due to the increased efficiency of using that same amount of feed. So um, by his calculations, about 71% of the effect of a strong systemic inflammatory challenge is related to 
um, decreased feed intake, uh, lethargy, birds don't want to get up to get a, uh, a meal or a drink of water, um, just general malaise, they don't feel well. Um, there's a decrease in, in uh, food passage rate, uh, and they, there's a modification in taste and smell. So again, if you think back to getting a COVID vaccine, that's kind of how I felt, and certainly my feed intake was, uh, was reduced at the time. But there's about a third, 29%, of other mechanisms that feed into it. And, and so uh, without going through uh, how he, he determined all this, uh, basically what he found was that 9% of that, um, that difference was due to uh, reduced digestive efficiency. So nutrient transporter activity goes down. The, the body is just essentially keeping nutrients out that would otherwise be available. Uh, a little bit of it is due to increased energy expenditure, so again, the, it, it costs energy to increase body temperature. Uh, there are metabolic inefficiencies. So for example, one of the factors of, uh, or one of the effects of reduced feed intake is that there's less nutrients available to the animal. But with a strong inflammatory response, nutrient requirements actually go up, particularly for acute phase protein synthesis. And so birds will voluntarily reduce feed intake, but they start to break down their skeletal muscle to provide amino acids for acute phase proteins in the liver. And then uh, the cost of the immune defenses, so um, maintaining or, or increasing barrier function, mucus thickness in the gut, um, the cost of producing more immune cells and the cost of producing these signals. So um, he, he said uh, that uh, these particular, these four uh, aspects accounted for most of the differences um, between the challenged birds and the pair-fed non-challenged birds. So the point I'm trying to make here is that um, a strong inflammatory response is uh, very costly to the animal's productivity. Now, in reality, we often don't see clinical disease. We don't see birds looking clinically ill. But if, if every bird in the flock loses 2 to 3% production, we might not be able to see that bird as being sick but you have two or 3% loss production times uh, a house full of 40,000 birds, and you have a local production of millions and millions of birds, and you have global production of billions of birds, and suddenly it adds up and becomes very economically important. I just want to use uh, coccidiosis as an example. So I recognize we're moving a little bit away from growth mode antibiotics, but I think some of the principles um, are similar. And also, of course, coccidiosis is a predisposing factor for some of the diseases that we would see uh, affected by growth mode antibiotics, such as necrotic enteritis. Uh, so this was some work done by uh, Bob Teeter at Oklahoma State University. Basically what he did was he did a six-day coccidiosis challenge. So he challenged the birds and six days later uh, measured various aspects. And he did this at different bird ages. So each of these, um, each of these rows is a different six-day period uh, in the life of a broiler flock. And, and I just want to point out um, very quickly, all of the birds were challenged but not all of the birds got equally sick. So in the flock, in the challenged flock, uh, the birds that, were, uh, that had a lesion score of zero had reasonably good growth rates, uh, they had relatively low maintenance energy costs, and therefore required relatively less energy per day. Uh, sorry, um, they consumed more energy, they, they voluntarily consumed more energy. The birds with the most severe lesion score had substantially reduced growth rate um, and they had substantially higher maintenance energy costs uh, and also decreased their energy consumption. So uh, they had increased energy costs and decreased energy consumption. That extra energy has to come from somewhere and it's going to come from their body reserves. So um, even when the birds were challenged early on, they saw reduced growth rate up to 48 days of age. Um, and the effect tended to be more severe when the birds were, uh, were challenged or infected later in life. Uh, in the same experiment, uh, he also looked at um, more precisely or, or more deeply into uh, energy balance. And so uh, he looked again um, at these birds within that same flock, ch all challenged, uh, with a lesion score of zero um, up to a lesion score of two. Uh, and again, uh, 
the, the uh, challenge, whether the birds had a lesion score of zero or, or two, uh, it was increased relative to non-challenged birds, but the, the increased excretion uh, of energy was lower when the lesion score was zero. Uh, the birds retained more energy when the lesion score was zero, uh, and their feed efficiency gain to feed was much better um, when they had a low lesion score. So the point is that when there is, when there is disruption in the gut, uh, there is an economic and performance cost. Now, if we looked, uh, he calculated this out based on how much energy is lost from the, the feed that's consumed. Um, so when lesion scores were zero, um, the birds had a theoretical energy, uh, the diet contained a theoretical energy content of 3,200 kilocalories of energy per kilogram of feed. Um, in smaller birds, uh, 800 grams, lesion score one, lesion score two, uh, a fairly dramatic drop in the energy that was retained by the bird. If we look at older birds, so these birds are, are three kilos, um, there's a really substantial, very strong negative effect on the energy, the effective energy in the diet. And so, again, we're talking about coccidiosis. I, I recognize that, uh, you know, we wouldn't be talking about growth-promoting antibiotics in this context typically, but there is a, a real cost to um, gut inflammation, and of course, there's a carry-on effect with susceptibility to necrotic enteritis. Okay, so now let's move into necrotic enteritis, and this is one of the most common challenges that we're trying to control with our use of growth-promoting antibiotics. Um, and just to put this in context, we know that feed is a very high proportion of total production costs, and we know that energy is a big part of the total cost of diet. Uh, some relatively recent work, um, some calculations uh, estimate that globally the cost of necrotic enteritis is five to six billion US dollars per year. Um, and that's largely associated with those effects of inflammation on performance. So reduced growth rate, reduced feed intake, reduced efficiency, um, and also an increase in condemnation. So there are external um, impacts on the bird as well. Okay, so we, we've taken for granted that antibiotics worked. They work, but we're moving away from them. So how well did they work? Well, uh, in an industry survey, um, uh, these researchers found that uh, antibiotic growth promoters increased growth and efficiency by 3 to 5%. Um, there was a positive response to AGP use about 72% of the time. This was from a meta-analysis. Um, and... Uh, my title talked about human health, so I wanted to get this in here. Um, there, it's a confusing picture when we talk about the impact of antimicrobial growth promoters on risk of zoonotic disease in humans. Um, there was uh, a study I found that showed that in uh, a conventional flock or a conventional production, this is across multiple flocks, um, there's Campylobacter isolated at processing about 16% of the time, uh, looking at alternatives, none of which have antibiotic, uh, antibiotic growth motors, the incidence of um, Campyl uh, Campylobacter is about 52%. Now, there's lots of other factors that feed into it, but um, there is a potential impact on, on human health. Uh, this was a really interesting study. This was a meta-analysis looking at the impact of um, antibiotic growth motors and uh, estimating the cost of removing antibiotic growth promoters from the diet. So this is a Brazilian, uh, Brazilian study. Um, they looked at um, 174 research articles that reported on 183 uh, experiments and experimentally 121,000 broilers. That's a, lot of, uh, that's a lot of broiler chickens to think about in an experimental sense. They took the results from this meta-analysis and extrapolated it to the entire Brazilian industry. Um, and so what they found was uh, in these papers, there was uh, a reduction in feed conversion ratio. Uh, and ultimately, when all costs and, and effects were considered, the removal of antibiotic growth motors cost the industry about three US cents per bird um, extrapolated per year. That was 183 million uh, U.S. dollars, if that worked out, uh, if that was extrapolated to the entire Brazilian industry. Uh, they also found a greater uh, impact early in life, which makes sense, uh, 
because early in life is when that gut microbiome is first establishing itself. It's much more plastic. It's much more susceptible to uh, the negative effects of colonization by pathogens. Um, a colleague of mine, Kim Livingston, uh, shared these slides with me, and it just, again, extrapolates out the impact of removing growth-promoting antibiotics. So um, one of the things that we see with growth-promoting antibiotics is that there tends to be uh, an improvement in environmental conditions, and so uh, they found a reduction in ocular problems, uh, a reduction in foot pad lesions, and also a reduction in air sacculitis. Um, all indirect effects of the controlling of the microbiome and the potential negative effects on, uh, on, on the, the bird. Now, there are other ways that we can maintain a good environment, and as we remove growth promoting antibiotics, those alternative methods of environmental control are going to become more important. Um, looking at the impacts, uh, we, we know that uh, there will be probably be an increase in, in mortality, uh, if growth rate is slowed, if we don't have effective alternatives, growth rate will be slowed. Um, there will be a, a reduction in bird density because we want to reduce the challenges. Uh, and we also will tend to see uh, an increase in cycle downtime. So one of the things I think that we've learned from the European experience is that when we remove growth promoting antibiotics, we need to have a longer downtime between flocks. This gives more time just for uh, the bacteria numbers to naturally reduce in the environment. And so overall, the consequences is a huge increase in the number of broilers that are required every year to provide the same amount uh, of meat. So uh, there are some potential negative environmental effects on uh, the removal of growth promoting antibiotics. So uh, an increase in the total amount of feed because the birds are less efficient and we need more of them. Um, increase in the amount of area uh, of land area needed to grow that feed an increase in the amount of water consumed, and an increase in the amount of manure that is produced. Now again, I'm not saying that we cannot remove growth promoters. I'm not saying that all this will happen if we remove growth promoting antibiotics. However, what I am saying is it underscores the importance of having effective alternatives to antibiotics. So what can we do? We take antibiotics out. What can we do to recover the impact that antibiotics have had in a non-antibiotic way. I'm not going to talk a lot about, uh, about it, but uh, management, husbandry, um, better environmental control, better biosecurity, these are all things that we will need to do, <clears throat> excuse me, all things that we will need to do in order to not have these negative impacts or, or reduce these negative impacts when we move away from growth promoting antibiotics. So I just want to spend the last few minutes talking about some alternatives to antibiotics. Um, these are things that I have seen to be effective. It's not a complete list. Um, if your favorite alternative to antibiotic, uh, uh, antibiotics is not included in this list, it doesn't mean that I don't think it works. Um, these are just some examples of, of some things that we've looked at um, and have some experience with. So um, the idea of probiotics. So we feed in a very simple way, we feed beneficial bacteria. Those beneficial bacteria colonize the gut and they prevent attachment uh, of the pathogenic bacteria. So uh, Dr. Palermo Neto mentioned the importance of a receptor. Those bacteria have to bind to the intestine in order to stay resident. And if not, they're just going to get washed through. And so what we want is a good protective layer of beneficial bacteria uh, and so the pathogens are simply washed through, even if they're present. They don't have the opportunity to colonize. Uh, prebiotics, as opposed to probiotics, are uh, indigestible materials that we feed to the bird. Um, they're not digestible by the bird, but they are digestible by certain categories of microbes within the gut. And so this is a way that we can uh, provide a competitive advantage to the beneficial bacteria um, and exclude or reduce uh, the presence of the bacteria, the, uh, the pathogenic bacteria. So you've probably seen this advertised in the context of human health, um, prebiotic food products or prebiotic additives for humans. Uh, and basically the, the simplified concept is that you're feeding the good bacteria. You're making it easier for them to outcompete the bad bacteria. Uh, 
And if there are any microbiologists in the room, I apologize for simplifying things to good bacteria and bad bacteria. I know it's much more complicated than that, but um, in, in the interest of time, we're going to uh, do that. Uh, this is some work we did with Steve Rickey, who's now at uh, University of Wisconsin. Uh, basically what we did was we fed, uh, in the context of a larger laying hen experiment, but we fed roosters various yeast-based products um, and we looked at uh, then an in vitro salmonella challenge. So we fed roosters these, uh, these diets uh, for a period of weeks. We collected the cecal contents um, and then we incubated the cecal contents with or without salmonella. And so we looked at the ability of these products to, uh, to reduce or, or eliminate salmonella. And so you can see that when we have no product, uh, we just have cecal contents or we just have um, the, the cecal contents with no, none of the um, yeast products. Uh, there, there is a slight reduction over time, uh, but when we include the various yeast products, we see a, a really dramatic drop in the presence of, of salmonella in vitro. And so um, Steve, Ricky, and I are, are working on ways to follow this up with some uh, in-bird challenge, uh, challenge work. Uh, oligosaccharides. Oligosaccharides are really interesting. They're, they're probably part of the, uh, the yeast story. Uh, but basically, these oligosaccharides kind of look like the attachment sites uh, on the intestinal surface. And so the pathogenic bacteria will recognize these oligosaccharides, bind to them. And again, once they're bound to those oligosaccharides that are free in the gut lumen, they can be eliminated. They're simply flushed out of the digestive tract. And there, there are oligosaccharides from yeast and there's oligosaccharides from fruit and, and various uh, plant carbohydrates. And so um, I think these, uh, these show promise as well. Uh, I could say a lot about enzymes. Uh, basically the idea is that uh, enzymes can be used to remove substrate that pathogenic bacteria uh, might, um, might utilize. They can, in the case of non-starch polysaccharide degrading enzymes, they can reduce digestive viscosity and help with creating a less hospitable environment for the pathogens and also reducing uh, the availability of unabsorbed nutrients. But I think there's a lot of potential for um, enzymes that specifically attack certain components of the bacterial cells as well. So things like uh, uh, flagellins, um, beta manins, proteoglycans, others. Uh, so I think this is, uh, this is an interesting area of opportunity as well. Uh, we've heard a little bit about organic acids. Uh, these have uh, fairly unique properties in that they, they don't dissociate in water. Uh, and so when we feed the organic acids and the microbes ingest the organic acids, then they dissociate. And so that creates an acidic environment within the pathogenic bacteria and the, the bacteria have to expend a lot of energy ex, uh, expelling the hydrogen ions and maintaining an, a normal intracellular pH. And so the idea is they're spending so much energy expelling the hydrogen ions that they don't have the energy left to, uh, to reproduce. And butyrate, uh, we've, we've heard about short-chain fatty acids. Butyrate is a particular short-chain fatty acids among others. Uh, but butyrate uh, is, is, is very interesting. It's a uh, four carbon fatty acid. It's, a, it's actually a fuel for intestinal cells. And so um, many of the prebiotic products uh, actually are substrate for bacteria that use the prebiotics to generate short chain fatty acids, including butyrate. So in effect, we're using those prebiotics to feed the bacteria, which are then feeding the cell, the intestinal cell uh, with butyrate. Uh, there's a, a large amount of research showing that uh, butyrate in the gut reduces uh, inflammation, it increases barrier function, um, and it also has uh, a systemic effect, probably partially uh, indirectly, but there may be direct effects as well. And so uh, the idea is if we can create an environment either through supplementing butyrate or, or increasing the microbial production of butyrate, uh, we can maintain gut homeostasis. And when we lose that gut homeostasis, when we lose butyrate producing bacteria, uh, we tend to see uh, more inflammation, we tend to see more uh, gut leakage, and so a loss of performance again, because we start to see a stronger inflammatory response right at that site of the gut. And that inflammatory response, if severe, can go systemic and have negative effects uh, on, on the entire body as well. <clears throat> 
Okay, so I'm just gonna end with this idea. Um, I've talked about some individual alternatives, but I think when we take antibiotics out of the diet, we cannot just replace it with one other product. So there's no magic bullet that's just as good as antibiotics that will work by itself. Um, and so we probably need multiple products that have different mechanisms of action. So different ways of, of reducing the challenge. So um, depending on the pathogens that we've got present, one set of challenges in one location or at one time might be different than uh, the challenge at a different location or even the same location at a different time. Um, so we need to have this multifaceted approach to cover our bases uh, in a way that antibiotics by themselves were able to do. And so the idea is if, if one strategy is not effective at that particular moment, the other strategies will be. This is uh, some field work that we did uh, in Colombia, uh, sorry, Ecuador. Uh, we had 56 commercial barns. We had over 2 million uh, commercial broilers. Uh, and we fed either the company's uh, standard diet, which did include some antibiotic alternatives, but also included an antibiotic growth motor. And then our two experimental treatments took out the antibiotic growth motor, uh, and we added things like an additional probiotic. We added a higher level of um, phytase. We added some additional enzymes. Uh, and of course, each of those products that we add comes with a cost. And so we looked at a third alternative, which was reducing some of the additives um, in an attempt to uh, reduce costs. And so to summarize, commercial barns, real world situation, uh, and we saw no effect on performance. So that's what we want. We take antibiotics out and we get equivalent performance. So again, this was over 2 million commercial broilers. Um, so body weight was not affected at 44 days of age and the European uh, production efficiency factor was not changed either. So, so this is really what we want. If, you know, when, when people sell you products, we're not realistically expecting for better performance than we had with antibiotics. We want to maintain what we had. So when we remove antibiotics from the diet, we, have a, we see a real impact. There are real risks with removing antibiotics, but that's the way that the world is going. So. Um, we run the risk of uh, an increased incidence of, of um, performance reducing uh, subclinical and clinical infections in broilers. There may be implications on foodborne pathogens. We do have a large number of alternatives. Many of them are effective experimentally. Uh, commercially, many of them are effective, particularly when we combine them. And so uh, I would just encourage you that we know that antibiotic-free production is already a reality. It's a matter of how do we increase the reliability? How do we increase the economic efficiency of being able to reduce uh, the, the use of antibiotics? So with that, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I'm looking forward to the uh, question and answer session at the end. So thank you very much.